Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts and I want to thank you for joining us today as we look to our topic on uh, looking at being able to generate and uh, improve our quality uh, through the torque verification process. And now, uh, if you have any questions during the uh, presentation, feel free to go ahead and put those into the chat or any comment that you might have. Uh, we can look at those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and so let's go ahead and get started uh, with our uh, presentation uh, today on torque verification. Now, uh, torque verification um, and torque calibration are a little bit different uh, in the way that they are used. And so uh, when we look at torque calibration, typically it is going to be the uh, measurement of a uh, tool or device. In our case, it's uh, dealing with uh, torque. Uh, and so we are measuring that particular tool against a standard. Uh, and uh, in most cases, uh, the standard needs to be four times uh, greater in accuracy than the tool that we are using. Uh, and so with that process, the um, calibration uh, takes place uh, and we have different steps uh, along the way that allow the tool that we are testing uh, to be traceable back to a certain standard. Uh, and uh, I do apologize if some of this is a little bit uh, basic or remedial uh, with the uh, idea of uh, the calibration, but just want to make sure that everybody uh, understands um, the terms uh, that we are using. And so when a tool gets uh, sent out to a, a lab or uh, a particular uh, company that you may have come in and do the calibration, um, when we uh, do the calibration of tools at mounts, uh, this is typically uh, the journey that we have. And so uh, we have three different labs. Uh, we have one at our corporate office located in San Jose, California. Uh, we also have one in Foley, Alabama, uh, and also in London, uh, England. And so the tool comes in and is received. That tool is then married to a specific bin, uh, bin number. Uh, and that stays with the tool the entire time it is at the facility. And so uh, next comes that tool is put into the system and the calibration order is generated. Next, that tool goes to our lab uh, for uh, the testing of the, the particular tool. Uh, also, if there are any adjustments that need to be made or uh, any repairs that need to be done, uh, that would be done at that time. Then the, the tool will then move to uh, getting and obtaining the actual uh, certificate. So that is generated uh, with the data that has been taken from the testing. And then finally, uh, it goes to a final inspection. Uh, and then the tool is then packaged and is ready for shipment. Uh, and so this is kind of the, uh, the journey uh, that most uh, of the tools that uh, we are dealing with, or it could be calibration um, equipment as well, sensors and analyzers. Uh, that is how uh, we uh, do it at Mounts. And so hopefully that will give you a little bit more insight on what happens when uh, your tools get sent out uh, for uh, calibration. And when the tools then do come back, there is a uh, usually uh, an ISO um, certificate, or it could be uh, a ANSI uh, Z540 um, certificate. So those are primarily the two uh, different uh, standards to which a, a calibration can be done. Uh, so it may be different for different customers. They may prefer one uh, particular test uh, or calibration over another. Uh, and typically when you get the uh, calibration um, certificate, uh, this is uh, an example of uh, one uh, that we just recently did for a, a customer. And um, kind of what I want you to uh, take a look at is uh, a lot of the material that uh, we need as far as the actual uh, tool uh, that is being used, uh, what unit of measurement that tool is, uh, the actual range of that specific tool, uh, the accuracy statement for that particular uh, tool. Then next we have the uh, actual date it was 
calibrated uh, the interval uh, that the customer has uh, requested for this particular tool, uh, when that next calibration date would be. Uh, and then we see the arrival condition. And in this case, uh, the tool arrived um, out of the manufacturer's spec. Um, and you can see that down here, um, this would be uh, the readings that were taken um, when the tool first came in. And you can see that they are out of the uh, tolerance or what would be acceptable uh, for the accuracy for this particular tool to be set uh, at 20 um, inch ounces in this case. Uh, so we have our tolerance of uh, 18 um, to 21 for our uh, actual um, accuracy. Uh, and you can see as found, um, all of the readings were a little bit on the low side. Uh, the calibration um, adjustments were made uh, and then the, the readings that the tool left as. And so um, this would uh, be a, a good example of a, a tool that uh, came into uh, our lab uh, that was out of the uh, spec for um, the calibration. Now, granted, it's not out uh, terribly, uh, but it is out of uh, the spec. So um, with that, we're looking at um, the different uh, types of uh, calibration intervals that uh, can happen. Uh, there are a lot of factors that can play into that. So for example, uh, it may be a, a very critical type of application uh, where any type of torque failure could lead to um, catastrophic failure. Um, it may be done based on the number of cycles uh, for a tool. Um, in a lot of cases, we see um, calibration intervals of either six months or 12 months. Uh, and so these are would be uh, typical um, calibration intervals. And so that's going to uh, basically lead us to our poll question uh, for today. And uh, our question is, uh, what is uh, the calibration interval process uh, for your torque uh, tools that you're using? So uh, is it every six months? Um, is it every 12 months? Uh, is it every 18 months? Or is it on a performance-based uh, type of uh, calibration? So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, give you a, a few seconds here to go ahead and complete that poll. All right, I don't know if we're having um, a little bit of uh, a technical issue, but um, I did not see the answers to um, the poll. Um, perhaps, let's see if we... Hey Dave, I just relaunched the poll. You guys should be able to vote now. Excellent, excellent. That gives us another opportunity to listen to this great music. All right, awesome. Thanks so much uh, for participating uh, in that. It looks like the uh, majority answer is every 12 months followed by every six months uh, and then followed by performance-based. Uh, so that's good uh, to know for our uh, discussion uh, for the remainder of the presentation. And um, you know some of the quality uh, challenges that um, come up during uh, calibration failures, uh, just like we did see in that uh, certificate uh, that we just looked at, um, you may have a drifting uh, tool uh, that may uh, again present itself um, out of tolerance when uh, it does go out for calibration. Um, when 
did that tool go out of calibration? Uh, if it's done, uh, in this case, the example that we're using is every six months. Uh, so within that six month period of, of time, uh, at what point um, did the, the tool actually uh, go out of its calibration? Um, then uh, what would be uh, the repercussions of that particular uh, event? Is, uh, is there going to be uh, a tremendous amount of uh, rework that may need to be done? Um, is there any type of uh, liability um, that uh, may need to be uh, considered? Um, do we need to uh, go back and do specific uh, tracing of uh, which certain products were used by that uh, or that tool was used on certain specific products? Uh, so all of that um, basically is going to uh, cost time and, and money. And so if we can avoid those things uh, that can certainly help uh, alleviate some of those uh, quality um, issues that may happen around the calibration failure. And so with that, uh, we can do basically a, a torque verification uh, program. Uh, and this is going to uh, basically allow us to do on-demand testing of our tools uh, and giving us that uh, confidence that we know that everything is uh, functioning correctly with our tools. We can help to avoid any type of inaccuracies that may be uh, present for a specific uh, application uh, with a specific tool. So we do have that ability to react quickly to what happens uh, with the use of that particular tool. Um, so it does give us quick uh, the ability to uh, be very nimble and quick about uh, how we determine uh, the actual effectiveness of a, a particular tool, uh, which then leads to um, a, a lot of uh, maybe our ISO uh, 9001 uh, type of uh, uh, continuous improvement uh, processes can be utilized through the, the, the torque verification uh, process. And um, it's again, gonna give us that ability to save time and money uh, in dealing with uh, tools that may uh, come back that were uh, presented um, out of calibration. The other interesting thing that we can do with this uh, type of program, uh, and many companies uh, that we deal with uh, do this same type of uh, testing, uh, and those who may have answered the win uh, on our poll question for uh, performance-based, um, that uh, the tools will only go out for calibration during um, the verification process if they fail uh, the verification. Uh, so you may have a tool that performs uh, very well uh, and um, it may have been two months or excuse me, two years or, uh, you know, say 30 months before or from its last calibration uh, that it has gone through uh, because when we're doing the verification process, uh, it has uh, passed each test uh, and it then um, allows us, uh, as long as we're doing the documentation of the process, uh, it allows us to uh, have the, uh, the traceability element of the analyzer uh, that we would be using um, to uh, basically calibrate that particular tool or at least uh, show that it is still within its calibrated range. And so until a tool starts to go outside of the acceptable range, uh, that is when the tool is sent out for uh, either um, calibration or, um, or repair. And so that's kind of the essence in the use of the torque verification um, process. And um, the, the types of equipment that uh, we would be using um, for this process uh, would be uh, the use of uh, possibly a portable or a handheld torque analyzer. Uh, we can use a number of different sensors uh, with that to do the testing. So we uh, have inline uh, rotary style transducers and uh, these transducers allow us to put the um, transducer between our tool and our part. So we could actually test the tool um, as it's being used uh, in the production environment. Uh, so there's no need to uh, remove the tool or take it to a lab or, or do anything like that. You can simply go out to where the tool is uh, and do that testing. 
You could do the same thing with a reaction style transducer that you see there on the uh, on the bottom right. Uh, and those would be uh, useful for uh, either hand tools, uh, torque wrenches. Uh, they can also be used with a joint simulator or rundown adapter uh, for testing uh, dynamic um, power tools um, as well. So that's one uh, type uh, or uh, equipment package that, uh, that could be used. Um, we also have uh, the ability to uh, use a torque analyzer that has a, a built-in sensor. Uh, in it. So it has a, a transducer uh, from a certain range um, and that will allow us to be able to take that out to the line. We could test the tools uh, on that uh, and then we have uh, that ability to capture uh, the data for a specific tool, uh, the specific readings, the time, the date, uh, and all of that information can then be downloaded um, to uh, some type of a documentation system that would uh, give you that traceability that you may need uh, to be able to verify when that tool was last tested. Now, it's always good to uh, use equipment that um, is very uh, easy to use, uh, that gives you um, visual uh, pass-fail uh, type of um, information uh, directly on the screen. Uh, and so uh, in this case, uh, with the use of uh, this analyzer, uh, you do have that um, ability to have uh, what would be a uh, acceptable tolerance based off of a specific torque value, which is gonna be uh, straight uh, up at 12 o'clock or, or due north uh, in a green area. Uh, everything below that value is going to be uh, from uh, yellow on and then anything over that value would be uh, in the red uh, area. Uh, so as we apply load um, or uh, torque is achieved um, on the sensor, um, we do have a visual, uh, really easy visual guide to be able to uh, look at that uh, value. And so uh, if we do plug in a specific torque, uh, we can and put in a specific tolerance percentage that we would uh, like to see from that uh, torque and the analyzer is automatically going to uh, set that for us uh, and again give us the ability to um, capture uh, the data uh, that we're using for a specific tool um, or that we're testing uh, and uh, allowing us to keep a historical record of the performance of a specific tool based off of the serial number of that tool. Um, so uh, the next uh, thing that you would need um, to uh, consider is being able to plan and schedule um, the validation process. And so uh, that's going to be looking at the frequency level uh, of when you would want to do the testing uh, and then developing the test procedure around uh, those frequency levels. And um, we do have uh, customers that will uh, do their uh, verification uh, bi-weekly, they do it weekly, uh, some do it uh, daily, uh, before a shift or at the end of the shift. Um, and then we have some customers in really sensitive uh, type of areas that um, actually uh, they do the verification process before the tool is used. Uh, so for example, uh, they would take a, uh, a torque screwdriver, uh, they test it five times on the analyzer, uh, if it passes that, then the tool is used. Uh, then they take another five readings after the tool has been finished used. Uh, that way they can keep a record of uh, that uh, tool uh, because the application um, is very critical uh, and they need documentation to allow the uh, actual um, torque values uh, to be able to be uh, used in uh, an event that there may be some type of issue uh, with the actual uh, fastening. So um, scheduling uh, when that would be done um, is, uh, is very, uh, very uh, important part of the process. And then uh, the benefits um, of the, the, the torque verification process, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it gives you the ability to uh, know um, how your tools are performing um, at any given time. Um, you have that ability to do the on-demand testing. 
um, giving you a peace of mind that your tools are performing uh, the way that they are supposed to and not being notified um, you know, four months uh, that the tool uh, was sent out for calibration uh, and at what point did uh, the tool go out of calibration uh, and trying to uh, research that uh, and that a bit of uh, a process that, uh, that may happen uh, when you do receive those tools that come back from calibration that have been found um, out uh, during the inspection process. Uh, and uh, again, if you do have that ability to uh, switch from uh, a more time-based type of uh, calibration uh, to a, a performance-based, um, then you have the opportunity to, to uh, save additional time and money uh, from sending those tools out or um, having them done uh, possibly in-house as well. Um, the actual, um, oh, excuse me, the, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Okay, the uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, anyway, uh, you do have that uh, ability to uh, be able to uh, move from a, a time-based system uh, where a tool may only be used uh, a couple of times um, or a very scarcely during that uh, period of time, uh, and then the tool is still being sent out. Um, if you do have that ability to test it, uh, then you do have uh, the confidence to know that that tool is still in spec uh, and you don't necessarily have to send it out. So I apologize for the uh, the, <laughs> the, the uh, brain uh, escaping me for a second there. So anyway, those are the, the benefits to the uh, actual uh, verification process. So um, in our demonstration today, uh, what we'll look at is uh, basically the um, method on how we can um, do that same uh, type of testing um, with the uh, Easy Torque uh, 3 that I uh, showed. And uh, we do have uh, basically uh, three uh, tools. Um, I've got a, an electric uh, power tool that we can use. Uh, We'll also test a, a torque screwdriver uh, and a torque wrench. And then we will use a rundown adapter uh, for the um, actual uh, testing of the power tool. Um, and so uh, with our uh, Easy Torque 3, um, I can simply power that on. Uh, it does have uh, an SD card uh, that is um, collecting um, the information from the actual uh, testing that we are doing. Um, so uh, in this case, if we want to uh, set our uh, torque for our first test, uh, that could be done um, in our uh, setup menu. Um, and uh, you can see here that uh, if I go to our, our number one setting, um, we can enter in what our target uh, torque is. And so if our uh, torque here is say 11.1 uh, inch pounds and we have a tolerance of uh, six uh, percent, um, and then we can also uh, adjust how we would like the, the system to uh, clear. So I have it set to automatically clear after one second. Uh, so it'll take a reading, then the uh, display will uh, go ahead and clear that after one second, and it can be anywhere from 0.5 up to uh, five seconds. So um, when we uh, typically uh, are doing um, a, a testing of a tool, uh, especially if it's not in use, um, you want to uh, basically warm the tool up or uh, give it the um, ability to um, exercise it a little bit. Um, and so in this case, uh, we can do that about five times or so. Uh, and then we can go ahead and do um, our testing at that point. Um, what I will show you um, here is um, when doing the, um, the exercising, uh, we can go into uh, basically our graph mode and we can turn on where the actual um, 
limits for our uh, testing um, is going to be. Um, and this is going to basically give us a graphic um, visualization of the torque that was applied um, to the, um, the analyzer. Uh, and so in this case, um, we did uh, get one reading. Um, if I could continue to go and it's going to capture uh, the other readings here. Um, and so now we've, we've kind of uh, warmed the tool up. Uh, we can then go and we can enter in uh, what the serial number is for this particular tool. So I can come in here, enter the tool serial number. And now uh, we'll have uh, the ability to link this tool to the readings that, uh, that, we, that we will be taking. Uh, we're testing in the clockwise position and we can come back to our operation screen. Uh, and so you can see our target uh, is at 11.1 uh, inch pounds. Um, we then have our, our min value, uh, our maximum value, the peak value, uh, and then our uh, hertz setting. So we can go ahead and uh, take our readings. Um, so anything outside of an acceptable level is going to be, uh, again, either in the what would be a, an orange uh, area just beforehand. And we can take uh, as many readings as we would like. But uh, for the sake of time, we don't need to uh, take uh, 25. But whatever um, basically the uh, management objective is uh, for what or how many readings you would like, uh, that's how you can uh, do that. And so we uh, have then used the um, hand tool. So we can go back into where our serial number is and we can clear that. Uh, and then we can set up our uh, testing for our, our power tool. Um, and so uh, in this case, we can set our target torque to uh, seven inch pounds, uh, I think is where, uh, where this tool is. Uh, and then we can use uh, a rundown adapter or joint simulator uh, to help with the actual uh, rundowns. And again, we want to uh, basically allow the tool um, to be used. Uh, a few times before we actually do our testing. All right, so in this case, then we can go ahead and we can start um, capturing um, data based off of the serial number. And then we can go ahead and capture those readings. Okay, and uh, again, you can go through uh, the different uh, examples here, but um, you did see that this tool is, uh, is performing a little bit on the high end of our uh, of our setting, and so at this point um, we can either um, have that tool uh, sent out, or it could be um, uh, sent to um, the uh, Cal Lab, or um, if you are uh, doing um, adjustments or setups yourselves, we can then uh, set up uh, the tool by uh, changing um, the torque. Um, on the, the cone of the tool, uh, and uh, that would allow us to adjust the tool, but um, that is um, for uh, another discussion, which we've, we've had <laughs> uh, before as well. So uh, feel free to look at some of our other uh, presentations as it regards to um, setting up power tools. But nevertheless, um, that would uh, give us that um, information for that particular tool. So now we can come back in and uh, we can uh, clear out the serial number. We can um, then uh, test our, our torque wrench. Uh, and so uh, if this tool 
um, is set to or performing to say 27 um, inch pounds. Again, we can go ahead and we can exercise this tool. Okay, and then we can come in and then enter in the tool serial number. And we now can go ahead and take our tests. And so on. So uh, that is um, basically how, uh, how easy it, it can be um, to do the uh, actual uh, on-demand and uh, torque verification of uh, the various types of tools that you may have um, on uh, your uh, assembly lines um, and giving you that ability to uh, be able to trace um, the readings uh, from the uh, analyzer certificate uh, to the dead weights that were used to calibrate the analyzer uh, and then all the way back to uh, what would be the standard for those particular weights. Uh, and if you do have uh, any questions on how uh, torque analyzers are calibrated, um, that, uh, that is uh, another uh, presentation that we have um, available uh, to you as well. Um, so that is kind of the uh, conclusion of uh, today's uh, presentation. Let's see. And uh, at this point, we can go ahead and move to uh, any questions that, uh, that we may have. So, Chris, do we have any questions? Hey, Dave, thanks. Yeah, uh, first question is, is the torque tester capable of being connected to a network? So uh, this particular um, uh, sensor, or excuse me, analyzer um, is not. Um, you can um, hook it uh, up and stream um, data out directly to a PC uh, through uh, into Excel uh, or... Um, another uh, type of database program. Um, so that, that can be done, um, but the analyzer itself um, is not, uh, not, does not have the ability to be put onto a network. Okay. Uh, next question, Dave, we got is, can a scanner be used for the serial number to prevent user error? So uh, with the uh, first example that I showed with our, uh, our P PTT uh, torque analyzer, we do have the ability to add a, a barcode um, scanner to that analyzer. Uh, you can simply scan the tool and it will pull up the, uh, the test information uh, that would be needed for that tool. So you can um, have the, uh, the tool tolerance that you would be using, um, how many readings you want to take, uh, and all of that time, date, stamp information uh, would then be used in that particular test. So it can be done with the use of our PTT or our LTT unit. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, next question we have is, do we offer a UID scannable entry for the tool instead of typing it in? Uh, not on the, uh, the Easy Torque 3. Uh, that would be uh, something that you could use, uh, I would assume, with the PTT or LTT with the barcode scanner. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, next question we have is, what is the tolerance typically used for a dynamic uh, tool? So uh, a, a dynamic tool can uh, vary from, uh, it could be anywhere from 3 to uh 15% depending on the style of tool. Uh, if you're looking at, at, at a DC uh, a screwdriver, uh, that type of tool, you're going to be in that, that range from 3 to 5%. Um, if you're dealing with a standard electric clutch tool, uh, that's going to be in the ballpark of uh, between 5 to 10%. Uh, if you are using a pneumatic uh, shutoff uh, spring clutch tool, that uh, again, is going to be in that ballpark of maybe eight to ten percent, uh, plus or minus. Uh, and then, if you're dealing with uh, with pulse tools, 
um, that have um, a hydraulic uh, clutch mechanism, uh, those typically will be in the area of uh, plus or minus 15%. Uh, so that's kind of the, the different ranges of, uh, of dynamic tools and uh, a general idea of the repeatability that you should see with those. Okay, and then the next question we do have, Dave, is is it always necessary to use a rundown adapter when testing a power tool? Uh, it it is because uh, you want the uh, the tool to get up to its uh, running RPM uh, because that uh, RPM um, can uh, in some some cases um, add additional inertia uh, that would be part of the repeatability of that particular uh, setting for that tool. Um, if we just put the the tool into a static transducer uh, and pull the trigger. Uh, there isn't going to be any movement um, of the actual drive. Uh, the pressure will build up and compress the spring and then the clutch will engage. Um, so there's really not any type of movement um, or RPM uh, developed by the motor. Uh, also, a, a joint uh, simulator can help to uh, simulate different style joints. So um, if you have a hard joint, you can set up the rundown adapter to better simulate a hard joint. Um, if you have a softer, uh, more gaskety type of joint, um, you can also set up the rundown adapter to uh, better simulate what that would uh, look like um, with those different uh, conditions. So um, the rundown adapter uh, and joint simulator can help mimic what the tool may be seeing on the assembly. Uh, and so uh, that's another reason why you would want to uh, use the joint simulator. All right. all right, Dave, I think that's all the questions we received today. All right. I want to say thanks very much uh, for joining us today. And uh, I hope uh, you find the information um, useful. Uh, and that uh, it may be uh, helpful for you and your organization. So we look forward to our, our next uh, presentation next month. And with that, we'll see you then. Thanks so much.